Maple Leaf Wrestling was the unofficial name in the 1970s and 1980s of the professional wrestling promotion run by Frank Tunney in Toronto, Ontario. It was 1930 in Toronto. As the Great Depression began over a decade of financial gloom, the city was experiencing a 30% unemployment rate. The Toronto Maple Leafs finished second in the NHL Canadian Division, but were knocked out in the quarterfinals of the Stanley Cup playoffs against the Chicago Blackhawks. Cadillac introduced its top-of-the-line model, the V16, which was first displayed at New York City's Automobile Show on January 4, 1930. And the promotion, initially known as the Queensbury Athletic Club, was launched by Jack Kokorin, who had previously promoted boxing in Toronto. Initially, Kokorin was involved in a promotional war with rival promoter Ivan Mikhailov, but after Kokorin allied himself with the new Maple Leaf Gardens in 1931, he took control of professional wrestling in Toronto. The Gardens would remain the main venue for the promotion for more than 60 years. Toots Mont was a well-known promoter and one of the main figures in the 1937 book Fall Guys by Marcus Griffin, where he was portrayed as a dangerous shooter, genius promoter, and a schemer. Lou Thez called Mont a thief and a liar, but conceded that he was a powerful and skilled wrestler. Compliments Thez didn't toss around lightly. What isn't so widely known about Mont is that he was a partner in Jack Kokorin's Toronto office and was even for a time the majority owner. He also became a resident of Ontario in 1932 and 1933, although not by choice. In the summer of 1932, Mont and his brother Ralph Mont, along with a woman described as a local dancer, were driving on Highway 24, just east of Collingwood, a resort town about 70 miles north of Toronto off Georgian Bay. Toots, who was in his late 30s at the time, was behind the wheel of a 16-cylinder Cadillac sports car. Just after midnight on August 21st, after coming around a curve, he collided with a car driven by J. Edward Burney of Toronto. Burney's passenger, 21-year-old Teresa Lucioni, was killed instantly. A coroner's request found that Mont had been driving too quickly, and on September 2nd, he was committed for trial on a charge of manslaughter. Mont was represented by prominent Toronto lawyer D. Lally McCarthy. At the trial in November, held in Barrie, Ontario, Collingwood Constable Lorne Davidson testified that, while in the hospital, Mont had offered him money from his pants pocket. In response, Mont said that he thought the constable wanted to buy some cigarettes or sandwiches or something, and offered some money he had in a drawer. Mont testified that he was only driving 35 to 40 miles an hour, and that it was Bernie who swerved over the line and into his car. The jury wasn't impressed. While the charge of manslaughter was dismissed, Mont was found guilty of criminal negligence following a four-hour deliberation. Mr. Justice Patrick Kerwin sentenced Mont to one year in the Ontario Reformatory in Gulf, and according to the Star, Kerwin had suggested an acquittal in his directions to the jury. The Star boasted that this showed the difference between Canadian and American justice. The Star's boast would turn out to be premature. McCarthy immediately filed an appeal for Mont. Mont spent a night in jail in Barrie, but was then released on $20,000 bail, half of which he put up himself, and the rest of which was deposited by Kokorin and stockbroker Percy Gardner. Mont was not allowed to leave Ontario, during which time he was spotted at at least one of the shows at the Gardens. The appeal was heard in late January, and in early February, the courts ruled in Mont's favour. The conviction was overturned and he was free to leave. That wasn't the end of Mont's problems, as the mother of the woman he killed in the accident filed a $10,000 lawsuit against him that was heard in December. A second action, heard at the same time, was brought against Ralph Mont by Bernie, claiming $5,000 in damages for loss of earnings and suffering. Supporting Mont's version of events at the civil trial was his dancer passenger, who, by an amazing coincidence, had since moved from Collingwood to New York. Bernie testified that Mont was driving across the center line. In Fall Guys, Griffin writes that Mont spent about $300,000 defending himself in the criminal and civil proceedings. Corrin stepped down in 1939 and was bought out by his assistants, John and Frank Tunney. John died just a few months later and the promotion was then run by Frank. Through most of the 1940s and 1950s, Frank Tunney's biggest star was local hero, Whipper Billy Watson 
who became two-time world champion. In 1950, Perkhurst was one of the biggest names in hockey cards. Since wrestling was so popular in Toronto and throughout Canada at the time, it was natural that Perkhurst would produce a line of wrestling cards and made two sets, a 75 card set in 1954 and a 121 car set in 1955. Today, the cards are frequently sold on eBay and complete sets in good condition are highly sought after collector's items. Frank Ahurst was working as an assistant to promoter Frank Tunney when Smith's illness propelled him into ring announcing. Ahurst was primarily a PR man who had previously worked as an assistant to Leafs owner Con Smythe and as a sports reporter for the Toronto Star. He joined Tunney in 1947. Ahurst bowed out as an announcer around 1955 but continued to work in the office with Tunney into the mid-1960s. In the late 1950s, his face was seen every week in an ad for the wrestling shows that was designed to look like a newspaper column. His byline also appeared in the program sold at the wrestling shows. Ahurst went on to work for the provincial government after leaving wrestling. Norm Kimber began working for Frank Tunney in the early 1950s while still in his early 20s. He eventually took over the PR duties at Ahurst performed and also became the Maple Leaf Gardens ring announcer after Hiff retired. He was phased out as an announcer in 1986 after Jack Tunney and Eddie Tunney had taken charge of the office and joined the WWF. Later that year, he briefly worked for Angelo Mosca's NWA affiliated shows in opposition to the Tunneys. Well known stars during the era included Larry Kasabowski, Gil Maines, Dano O'Shocker, Bill Stack, Doug Hepburn, Lou Petoskia, Waldo Van Sieber. Tommy O'Toole, Pat Flanagan, Nanjo Singh, Joe Killer Christie, Strangler Wagner, Fred Atkins, and Lee Henning. In 1962, on the advice of wrestler Yukon Eric, Bruno Sammartino contacted Toronto promoter Frank Tunney, hoping to take advantage of Toronto's large Italian population. Despite Vince McMahon trying to blackball him there, Tunney decided to take a chance. Sam Martino made his Toronto debut in March 1962 and very quickly became an attraction. His ability to speak Italian also integrated himself with the immigrant population. With Canadian legend whipper Billy Watson, Sam Martino won his first professional wrestling championship in September 1962, the local version of the International Tag Team Championship. Soon he was in demand by other promoters in different Canadian territories. During his tenure in Toronto, San Martino wrestled and beat then National Wrestling Alliance World Heavyweight Champion Buddy Rogers for the title. However, Rogers was unable to continue after being accidentally butted in the groin while attempting a leapfrog, and San Martino refused to accept the title under the circumstances. San Martino also wrestled NWA World Heavyweight Champion Lou Thez twice in Canada. One match ended in a draw, and the other with Thez scoring a fluke pin after a collision, despite San Martino controlling the 20-minute match from the beginning. Like Thez's win over Buddy Rogers, this match was booked by NWA kingpin Sam Muchnick as a preliminary to the forming of the WWWF to ensure the dominance of the senior organization and its championship. Thez recounted the match as nothing special. Meanwhile, Vince McMahon Sr. was having a tough time drawing fans with the newly created Worldwide Wrestling Federation World Heavyweight Champion Buddy Rogers in New York. Promoter Willie Gilsenberg appeared on Washington DC TV, referred to a non-title match in Canada and returned the championship belt to Buddy Rogers. It was also mentioned that Rogers lost to Thez in a one-fall bout, but NWA rules specified that the title could only change hands in a two out of three falls match. Thus, Rogers had not legitimately lost the title. Eventually, promoters Toots Mont and Vince McMahon Sr. cleared up San Martino's suspension by paying his $500 fine. After many weeks of phone calls with McMahon trying to lure San Martino back, San Martino demanded a title match with Rogers. Starting in 1969, the shows were headlined by The Sheik, which continued for more than eight years. Over the decades, they kept the gardens busy on nights when there was no hockey game. Canadian, British Empire and world titles were all fought and defended there. 
Tunney's 30th anniversary show was held on May 18, 1969 and featured a rematch between The Sheik and whipper Billy Watson and the Toronto debut of NWA world champion Dory Funk Jr. The show drew 13,000 fans, making it the highest reported attendance at a Toronto card in years. In 1978, Tunney began working with promoter Jim Crockett Jr., who ran Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling in the Carolinas. The two would become partners in the Toronto promotion, along with George Scott, a key executive with Crockett, who had been a preliminary wrestler for Tunney from 1950 to 1956. Following Frank's death in 1983, the business was run by John's son, Jack Tunney, and Frank's son, Eddie Tunney. The Tunneys hosted National Wrestling Alliance and Mid-Atlantic Wrestling matches until 1984, when Jack Tunney abandoned Crockett and signed with Vince McMahon's expanding World Wrestling Federation, with Jack serving as the figurehead on-air president of the WWF from 1984 to 1995, while also serving as the legitimate president of Titan Sports Canada, the local arm of the WWF's parent company. Following the WWF takeover in 1984, the name Maple Leaf Wrestling continued to be used by the Federation's Canadian TV program which the WWF took over production of after the Tunney split from the NWA. The show was hosted by Angelo Mosca and Jack Reynolds. They usually call me Big Nasty at King Kong, but this week we have the most exciting wrestlers professional wrestling today. TV tapings for the show were held in Brantford and other cities in southern Ontario for the next two years, until WWF seized the tapings in 1986 and decided to simply use the Maple Leaf Wrestling name for the Canadian airings of WWF Superstars of Wrestling. On-air announcer Billy Red Lions was also added in. These tapings were actually the precursor to the WWF's Wrestling Challenge, which became the B-Show to WWF Superstars of Wrestling, the A-Show. Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura were the hosts for the Canadian tapings, with Ventura doing his famous body shop segment. And when the tapings morphed into Challenge in 1986, Ventura was moved to the A-Show, Superstars, which had been renamed from WWF Championship Wrestling and joined their announcers Vince McMahon and Bruno Sammartino to form a three-man team. Sammartino eventually left that team, making it just McMahon and Ventura. Bobby Heenan replaced Ventura as the Canadian tapings became WWF Wrestling Challenge. In 1995, McMahon chose to run the shows in Toronto without any involvement from the Tunnies. The final show at the Gardens was held on September 17, 1995. Some performers included Whipper Billy Watson, The Sheik, Ric Flair, Gene Kaniski, Dara Singh, Bruno Sammartino, Angelo Mosca, Dewey Robertson, Sweet Daddy Siki, Tiger Jeet Singh, Johnny Valentine, and Terrible Ted. The Toronto version of the NWA British Empire Heavyweight Championship was a major singles title in the city's NWA affiliate Maple Leaf Wrestling from 1941 until 1967 when the title was abandoned. The first holder of the title was Earl McCready in June 1941 when the New Zealand version of the title was recognized in Toronto. The last champion was whipper Billy Watson until the title was retired in 1967. The NWA Canadian Heavyweight Championship was the top singles title in Maple Leaf Wrestling from 1978 until 1984 when it was abandoned after the Toronto promotion partnered with the World Wrestling Federation. The title was reinstated as a present day NWA board controlled version of the NWA Canadian Heavyweight title. Previous versions also existed in Calgary, Halifax and Vancouver. The first champion was Dino Bravo when on December 17, 1978, he defeated Gene Kaniski in Toronto. The title was briefly vacated in July 1994 when Maple Leaf Wrestling was sold to the World Wrestling Federation. The title was brought back on October 24, 1998 when Easy Rider defeated Paul Atlas at the NWA 50th Anniversary Show in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. The NWA Canadian Television Championship was a secondary singles title from 1982 to 1984 when the title was abandoned after the promotion left the NWA to join the World Wrestling Federation. The old Canadian TV title belt 
was later used as the physical belt for the heavyweight championship of the now defunct Apocalypse Wrestling Federation in Toronto. The first title holder was Jay Youngblood, when on June 27, 1982, he defeated the Destroyer in a tournament final. The NWA Canadian Open Tag Team Championship was the top tag team professional wrestling championship in the Canadian promotion from 1952 through 1961. The title was then replaced with the Toronto version of the NWA International Tag Team Championship. The first champions were Pat Flanagan and Whipper Billy Watson, when on August 28, 1952, they won a tournament when they defeated Hans Herman and Lord Athol Layton. The last champions were Leo DiPaolo and Billy Red Lions, when on January 26, 1961, the title was replaced with the Toronto version NWA International Tag Team Championship. The NWA Toronto United States Heavyweight Championship was the version of the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship that was defended in Frank Tunney's Toronto-based Maple Leaf Wrestling. It existed from 1962 until 1973. A different version of the title was brought into the territory by the Sheik in 1974 and defended until 1977. After that, Maple Leaf Wrestling recognized the Mid-Atlantic version of the title from May 1978 until July 1984 when Jack Tunney allied himself with the WWF. The first person to hold the title was Johnny Valentine when on September 22, 1962, he arrived in Toronto and was simply billed as a champion on arrival. The title was vacated when the reigning champion, The Sheik, left the area in 1977 and took the belt with him. From that point on, the Mid-Atlantic version was recognized in Toronto until 1984. That was the untold story of Maple Leaf Wrestling.